Welcome back to Module 6, and welcome to Chapter 29, The Big Bang. This chapter contains some of the more brain-melty kind of topics, and I want to encourage you to recognize that your confusion in this chapter may be more because scientists haven't figured out a lot of what we're going to be talking about fully um, unless that you're missing the goals that we're trying for. Uh, one of the best things I can try to convey here is that there's a lot that we cannot get into the details of because we don't have complex math or physics for this chapter. It hasn't hindered us nearly as much in any other chapter, but here we're really only going to skim the very surface and kind of come, a, come away with a couple of key sentences of understanding that if we probe a little bit deeper, we might recognize really are only a surface understanding, but that's the best that we can do for our curriculum and the time that we have. Our big goal for the entire chapter is to try to think about the following questions. Now notice how I even wrote here, we will think about these questions, not that we're going to answer them, because of that limitation that we have being a survey course uh, without required um, algebra or higher math skills. So our goal to understand is figuring out what we mean by the word universe. What is the universe? We're gonna be answering that in this video. We're gonna figure out what the question really is asking for is the universe infinite and how we answer it. That will also be this video. And then in upcoming lecture videos in this chapter, we will think about what the universe is made of and how we figure that out and what we were able to rule out. And we will talk about the eventual fate of the universe and again, think more about what we've been able to rule out rather than what we think is the single correct answer because it's still a topic of discussion in the sciences. Okay, so let's start with what is the universe? At this point in the curriculum, we have learned about our galaxy in chapter 25. We learned about our local group in chapter 26, the fact that we belong to several different galaxies that are all clustered together in one neighborhood, and about the fact that there are these galaxy superclusters that we are a part of as well. With all of that large scale structure, much of which we really don't have a way to easily think about the scales for in our heads, what is the universe then? The universe, capital U universe, is everything. All there ever was, all there is, all there ever will be is part of the capital U universe. There is nothing outside of the universe. And I don't mean nothing like void. I mean, we cannot define an outside of the universe because the universe is everything. I know already on the second slide uh, of the chapter, brain's melting a little bit. That's a good sign. Now we build mathematical models of the universe to help us understand it. Cosmology is the subfield of astronomy, and it is extremely math and programming focused, uh, which is why we can only scratch the very surface of this chapter. But cosmology refers to the study of the overall structure and evolution of the universe, and it's kind of like the science of building model universes and comparing their results with the real universe we see around us. So the second question then, is the universe infinite? There are a lot of misconceptions people have about this, partly because there is no way for us to imagine a sense of scale here, and partly because it's easy for us to imagine some small point that expanded outwards, but we're going to try to come away at the end of this chapter with the understanding that it, that, that does not describe the real universe. If we had a center to the universe and an edge, then it would be finite in size. So let's think about that. An edge implies that there's something outside the universe, which by definition isn't possible. And a center would need an edge to be measured from. The center of a circle is equal distance from all points on the edge of the circle. 
But if we have no edge, there's no way to have a center. So there can't be a center either. All right, so we've answered part of this question. The universe is infinite in size. It goes off in all directions forever, no matter where we're looking. We will eventually be talking about the um, observable universe, and we need to recognize that that puts a limit on something, not quite size, but on something. Now, we have probably heard before this class the phrase Big Bang Theory. Whether it's in reference to the TV show or whether it's in reference to the scientific idea, we have probably heard that term. I think 90% of us probably started this semester and currently still have a very incorrect idea of what that means, and we'll talk about why that incorrect idea is so pervasive. But for now, in this first video, the key thing that we need to take away is that the Big Bang refers to the starting moment in time for the universe. When time first has meaning of any kind, t equals zero seconds, that's the Big Bang, the starting point in time. Not a starting point in location, because the Big Bang happened everywhere in the infinite size universe. But it means that there's an age to the universe, because time has been passing, time has been elapsing since that Big Bang moment. So the universe is not infinite in age. It has a finite age. There's a starting moment in time. And then we've gone 13.7 billion years since that starting moment in time. And something that we may not have thought about before right now, because light has a finite speed. Back in chapter five, we talked about light speed how all light travels at the same speed in space. And if light has had 13.7 billion years to travel to us, it means that something that's even further away than light being able to go as fast as it can, we wouldn't have had a chance to see it yet. There's a lot more complex um, details that go into determining how far away we can see but there's a difference between the capital U universe and the small portion of it that is observable. And so we define the observable universe, which does have an edge, but that is simply based on our perspective. Imagine being in a dense and dark forest and you have a medium power flashlight. You can shine it in all directions and see trees up to a certain distance but then you can't see further than that, even though there are more trees there. It's the same kind of thing here. Although the observable universe is not based on how strong our flashlight is, we're talking about this theoretical boundary, no matter how good our telescopes are, and no matter how long we spend looking at a particular patch of sky, there's still a boundary to what we're able to see because of the light travel time and other details. So anytime that you see a figure in a textbook showing an edge to the universe, what they are trying to convey is the observable universe, which we are at the center of because we're with our own little flashlight in the forest. Imagine having a friend hundreds of yards away in that forest with their own flashlight. You might not even see each other. You will each have your own little observable portion um, based on where your perspective is. So we need to recognize that. If some of that didn't quite make sense, I recommend just pausing the video, taking a moment to reread these words, maybe rewinding it to have me talk us through that again before continuing. Because we don't want to overwhelm ourselves in this chapter, which is going to be easier to do in this chapter than any other. Okay, let's keep going. So graphics like this are trying to convey things, but it is graphics like this that tend to build this misconception that we have that everything started at a single point. It's the same thing for um, solar system models. In the final module of the semester, module seven, we'll be finally getting around to talking about our own solar system. Um, and every picture we've ever seen in textbooks is an incorrect scale model and it builds misconceptions. 
but it's because we're limited to having a, an indicated figure that's trying to convey some information. But we need to recognize that the Big Bang re refers to the single moment in time that the universe started, and we can continue time since then. But the universe was still infinite in size, so that Big Bang moment was happening at all points. And this is trying to indicate a single patch of this infinite universe and how it expands. I know, more brain melting, I get it. And we need to recognize that we're limited in what we are able to think about in this chapter because some of it is just impossible to, um, impossible to come up with a, a mental model of. And in fact, when we do try to think about mental models, we often have to rely on some simplified pictures to do so. All right, let's take a moment and think about Hubble's law. It was introduced in chapter 26 when we started to recognize that galaxies are moving away from us. And it was used as a way to get distances to extremely far away galaxies because if we can measure their Doppler shift, the rate at which they're moving away from us. And Hubble's law tells us what that distance ought to look like. If you don't remember that from chapter 26, I do encourage you to go back to those lecture videos and slides from the previous module. But this picture here is showing if we had like a rubber ruler. So we've printed centimeter marks and we've got a couple of ants here, but we've now stretched out the ruler to twice its length. Okay, those pre-printed marks are, not, are now much further away than they used to be from each other. And the ants are now all farther away from each other than they used to be, which means that they are moving apart, not because they walked around, they're all still standing on the same number that they were before, but because we've physically stretched the ruler out. This is a single one-dimensional indication that is starting to help us maybe think about how Hubble's law really works. The ants that started close together, there's a smaller amount of um, rubber ruler between them, and so they're separated but by not a lot. The ants that started very far apart, there's a lot more rubber ruler between them, and so they have separated by a greater amount. They are moving away at a faster rate. Another thing that might help us think about this is raisin bread. It's a very common model or analogy when we're thinking about the uh, universe. When raisin bread bakes, the raisins themselves stay raisin-sized because they're being held together. But the bread itself expands. And so all of those raisins are roughly in the same placement relative to each other, but are now all farther away than they were before. You can look at all of these different numbers, and no matter what raisin we're considering, everything is moving apart in a way that fits Hubble's law. Any model that we make, though, has limits. The loaf of bread is really useful for thinking about Hubble's law in three dimensions, unlike the one-dimension rubber ruler, but a loaf of bread has a clear center and a clear edge, and that's a problem for us. So another common model that is used is the surface of a balloon. So we might draw stuff out on the surface of a balloon, and then blow up the balloon to expand it. And in this particular analogy that we're thinking of, there is only the surface of the balloon. We can't talk about anything above the surface. It doesn't exist. We can't think about the interior of the balloon. We are thinking about everything that exists only being the surface of the balloon itself. So on the slide, I have four characteristics of the real universe listed. The real universe has no center. The real universe has no edge. The real universe is expanding. And the real universe has three dimensions in space and one dimension in time. It's a four-dimensional universe. So I want you to pause the video here and think about this. How many of these characteristics are accurately represented by the surface of this balloon in the analogy? All right, 
So the surface of the balloon has no center. If we were a little ant, we could walk around forever and ever, and we would never come across a center to the surface. The real universe has no edge. If we were that same ant, we would never fall off an edge. We could keep going forever. The real universe expands. The balloon analogy is used so often because we know that balloons expand. But the problem with this particular analogy is that the surface of the balloon only has two dimensions of space. We can go side to side or forward and backwards, but we can't go up and down. And that's the limitation of this balloon analogy. If we think of back to the loaf of bread, it has a center, so that doesn't fit. It has an edge, so that doesn't fit, but it fits the other two. So having this kind of set of different models to think back to is useful because no single model is going to be perfect for us. Okay, so I know that there's a lot already in this chapter. And our real goal is to come away from this chapter with an understanding that these, this set of statements is true for the universe. To understand what these statements mean, how we figure them, them out, and confront any misconceptions along the way. So we're starting at the bottom and building this kind of pyramid of knowledge. The universe not having an edge is one that is really difficult for us to picture because it is easy for us to imagine space and then void, but that's not what the real universe is like. The universe has no center, and that is also difficult for people to think about because of the misconceptions we have around the Big Bang Theory. Imagining some single point that exploded is easy for us to imagine, but it is not the real situation. The universe having a finite age, that's a little bit easier for us to acknowledge. There's a starting point a lot of us may have before this class known about that 13 or 14 billion year old age. The universe is expanding. We actually talked about that when we introduced Hubble's Law back in chapter 26. And we'll be building on that step um, as we continue on through these slides. But that's currently where we're at. We haven't talked about the upper steps left but we will in the next videos. So I encourage you to take your time with chapter 29 and give yourself a little more um, understanding if things don't quite make sense in this chapter, because there really are things that are extremely difficult to grasp, even if everything I'm conveying is landing properly. And it's because of the limitations we have on just the human capacity for picturing these kinds of topics, as well as the limitations we have on our math and physics background available. So I will see you in that next video.